Now, we've been in this series in Colossians chapter 3. We've been in this series now. I'm on the fourth week. And, and, and I want to walk you through, if you want to go ahead and get, get ready, in our reading today, we are going to be in chapters 3 and 4. We're going to take a, a verse in chapter 3, and we're going to compare and contrast with two verses in chapter 4. So if you want to go ahead and get there, I, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to, con we're going to contrast two readings from these two chapters to kind of give us a look at where we ought to be. But let me take you back on the journey. Let me walk you through this. As you, as you think through through what we've done. We've talked about put your clothes on. We've talked about being clothed in righteousness, being clothed in Christ likeness. And if you'll remember, we started out the very first week, we started out with being clothed in truth, the capital T, truth of God, being clothed in truth and knowing that the word of God is the truth that we should clothe ourselves in. Then the next week we talked about being clothed in purity. God's word has a statement for us as to how we should handle or use or allow our bodies to be used in this life. And then God's word is truth. So if you take hold of the first week, capital T, truth, clothe yourself in truth, and then you begin to read in the second week, again in chapter 3 of Colossians, that there's a way that we should allow our bodies to be used, both physically and specifically sexually is what we talked about. Then God's purity is what we clothe ourselves in. And then last week we talked about clothing yourself in love. And love being the way that good people become great people. Because great people are people who love greatly. You need to understand that. You need to know that. You need to receive that. And so what we're talking about this week is being clothed in grace. Now the question becomes, why is all of this such a big deal? And, and, and let me go back and let me talk through that before I jump into the rest of today's sermon. I need you to understand that when the world looks at us, when the world sees us, when they look on us, the first thing they see is our clothing. What they see is what we're wearing. In fact, most of you today got up and put some thought into what you would wear today. Some of you did not, I understand that, but most of you did, all right? And you, you thought through it. You stood in your closet for just a moment. If you, The men in the room kind of stood in their closet and went, yeah, one, two, three, four shirts I'm going to choose. Today's a three-day. I mean, you know, that's the way you did it. Uh, for some of the ladies, it was, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, no. And it, was, it took hours, you know. And so I, I, I understand that. But all of us thought through to some degree what we would wear today. Why? Because what we are wearing speaks to the people around us about what we are feeling or what we want to communicate or who we are. What we are wearing speaks to all of that. Now, it, it, it's true, it's true that, that, that when we put on certain outfits, we emit a cer certain, what am I saying? We set a certain standard and we say to folks, this is what you, I want you to know about me today. For instance, I know most of you don't think this is true, but I think through very clearly what I'm going to wear on Sunday mornings around here. Uh, they really laughed at me last night because I had on flip-flops. <laughs> and, and it's like, you, you really think through that? Well, yeah, we do. We, we, we strategically think through what I'm going to wear. You say, well, come on, preacher. When did you come up with like the jeans thing? Well, it was real simple. See, folks today, really, when they go to church, they, wanna, they want a comfortable experience. They want a, ca a more casual... Look, can I be honest with you? Most men don't own a suit anymore. Amen. Hey, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Most men don't even own a suit anymore. If they, have a, if they have a need for a suit, a coat and tie deal, they have to go shopping to get that, to fill that need before they can go there. I want you to hear me. No one should ever have to go shopping and buy new clothes to find new life. That should never be true. And you see, the traditional idea is, well, pastor, I want to see you in the suit and tie because that means that you look, you know, that means that you're prepared and you, you've dressed properly to come before the throne of God. Look, 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 how the, the fabric I have on is not what my God is worried about. He's worried about how I'm clothed, but that's a different conversation than the fabric I have on my body. You understand that, right? Because when we're talking about being clothed in this sermon series, I ain't talking about shirts and jeans. We're talking about how you are clothed in the righteousness, the truth, the purity, 
the love, the grace of Christ, being clothed in that. You say, you say oh, Pastor, you, you, so you're telling me that you, you, you specifically thought through and, and you guys specifically wear certain things. Yes! If you come in here and I'm wearing a suit, you're going to expect one thing in this church and you're going to get something else and you're gonna, that, that doesn't make sense. And none of you want to see me in a robe. <laughs> it's just not a pretty thing, you know. It just doesn't work for me. I get all caught up in them. I get, it was, I, mm, not a good deal. And you know, so, so, so the truth is, well, think about it. Think about the building. Think about the property for just a minute. You realize the building you're sitting in is a metal building, right? We bought a metal building. You say, no, you didn't. It's got brick on it. No, no, we bought a metal building and we dressed it in brick. <laughs> why? I'll tell you why. It's very simple. Because in Southern Maryland and in La Plata specifically, every important building has brick on it. Just think through that one a minute. I said, all right, important buildings, brick, church, brick, lots of brick. Why? Because it's an important building. Yes, Chick-fil-A has it. <laughs> Chipotle is in brick. Need I say more? You know, you, know, you, I mean, you, you see what I'm saying? I mean, the, the truth is that, that we dress the place. And you say, pastor, pastor. Some of y'all are going, oh, wow. Pastor, this is really shallow. This is really shallow. Well, yeah, you could say that. Or you could stop and say, what they chose to dress in actually speaks to something deep inside. Because the fact that we chose to make the church more casual speaks to the fact that we want to reach people who don't have a history of church so they don't own a suit. So actually what seems shallow to you is really quite deep. The reason we're going to put brick on these buildings and make sure the place is landscaped well is so that when you turn the corner and drive in here, all of a sudden just by natural, it, just by natural instinct, you turn the corner and two things happen. One thing happens, you look and you go, wow, this is well cared for. They actually care about what this place looks like. And secondly, you start to go, there's not a project for me to do. <laughs> Although some of you walk by the islands and go, I got to pick weeds. I got to pick weeds. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean the, the, the truth is, this may se seem shallow to you, but it's not. And then we stop talking about clothing. And we start talking about clothing. And when you clothe yourself in truth, when you clothe yourself in purity, when you clothe yourself in love and in grace, you may say, Pastor, that's just putting on a front. That's just putting on a face. You're just being shallow. You're just trying to make the world think that you're pure. Or you're just trying to make the world think that you, are, you, you believe in truth. Or you're just trying to more make the world think that you're... No, no, no. That, that may be true in some people's cases, but that's not what I'm advocating. Because what I'm telling you is what you put on the outside always speaks at least to some degree to what exists on the inside. You're always advertising something. You're always saying something. What are we saying with how we clothe ourselves? Now I say all of this because I believe that today's sermon in particular, today's scripture in particular, speaks to how we present ourselves to the world. So in order to get into that, let me jump into the, the, the reading today. Now I'm going to start with chapter 3. I want to read chapter 3, and we're just going to read one verse today. Chapter 3, and it's going to be verse 8. All right, so let's read this together. Read this with me. Um, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Now I'm going to pause there. We read through this whole section last week, if you remember this. We went through the whole section and we got the whole, in fact, we read this verse last week and we came up with another list of things that needed to be gotten rid of. You must let go of things such as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. You got to get rid of those things. You got to, the, the, the literal Greek here means put them away from you, put them aside, let them go, get them out of your presence. These things need to go away. 
Okay, so that's the negative side of it. But let's read something else. Take me to chapter 4, and we want to start with verse 2. And we're going to read a whole section of, of verses here, because we're only really going to focus on two of them, but I want to read the whole section, because I want you to pick up what the apostle is saying. Now listen, before we read, in chapter 4, the apostle Paul is starting to wrap up his letter. He's kind of said what he needs to say. He's gone through all of his lists of get rid of these things, don't do these things, go away from these things. He's gone through all of his lists. He's begun to kind of say, clean up your act, and now he's starting to wrap the whole thing up. He's starting to bring it all back together and put an end to his letter. When he does that, he gives some different, some final instructions that start for us in verse 2. So I want us to read from here. Read with me in this right here. Devote yourselves to prayer. Pause just a minute. You say, Pastor, how in the world am I supposed to get rid of all these things? I mean, everything you've preached on the past few weeks, everything is... Di you haven't given us an easy idea in the past three weeks. And now you're going to throw more at us today. You mean, uh, come on, Pastor. Uh, <laughs> come on now. You, you, you preached at me about truth, which means I got to actually follow the Bible. Then you preached on purity and... <laughs> Come on, Pastor, now. And then you talked last week about loving folks and forgiving folks, and I don't know about all that. And now you're going to throw, how am I supposed to do all of that? Let me suggest verse 2 to you. Devote yourselves to prayer. Because prayer will get you there. Prayer is the pathway toward clothing yourself in righteousness. Prayer is the power source toward clothing yourself in righteousness. Prayer is the tool you need in your toolbox to get this work done. All right? You say, okay, okay, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. That's it. Go back to the beginning. Devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Now, focus on verses 5 and 6, okay? Let's focus on these. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Why? Why should I be wise in the way that I deal with outsiders? Why? Because, friends, listen to me. The world needs the Jesus that you carry about. And sometimes the thing that is keeping them away from our Savior is us. I got to be honest with you. When, when I have conversations with people who are struggling with faith, often folks will bring them to me and they'll say, I want you to talk to Pastor Mike. And they'll say, Pastor Mike, I want you to talk to so-and-so. What that usually means is the conversation has gone far enough that the person who is trying to lead someone to Christ has run out of words. They don't know what to say next. And they come to me because they think I'm full of words or something. And um, so they bring people to me. And so I'll sit down and talk to them. These conversations always go in the same vein. They happen differently based largely on, uh, on, on the way a person thinks and on, uh, sometimes on educational level, these conversations go differently. But I need to tell you, even though the conversation goes differently, it has the same idea behind it. People who are uh, versed in history will start with, why should I believe in this God of yours? Why should I believe in this Christianity of yours? They will come against it in this way. They will say, your Christianity is not so great. Your Christianity produced the Inquisition. And they'll talk about the Inquisition, which is a historical fact where parts of the church got together and began to truly, honestly persecute and execute folks who were not following the, the, the biblical prescription the way that group inside the church wanted them to follow. It was a bad idea. It was wrong. It, is not, it was not the way Jesus would have dealt with the world. It was messed up. All right, and by the way, some of you are thinking, yes, but that was a Catholic thing. Yeah, it sure was until it got up into New England with the witch hunts. And so it's kind of the same idea going on there. Folks, we have to understand there are times when people who call the name of Christ don't act anything like the Christ whose name they call. 
And we have to understand that and we have to accept that. There's no sense in, you know what I don't do? I don't try to defend those moments. There's no sense in defending those moments. Then after we have this conversation, I'll say, you know what, I, 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 you know, I, I can't apologize for all of Christianity. You know, I, I can't do that. I can tell you that this was wrong. I can tell you that Jesus would not have dealt that way. I can tell you that executing people in the name of the Jesus who said, do not hate your enemies but love them is just completely, it doesn't work. It doesn't balance out. I don't know how people even got there. You know, and so I, 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 all I can tell you is I'm sorry. And I move on. And then they say, well, what about the Crusades? Well, that was a bad idea, too. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was politics taking over the church. And friends, listen to me. Anytime politics takes over the church, the church loses. You need to know that. And the truth is, both of those were bad ideas. They were real. They occurred. But they were bad ideas, and, and you kind of have there, people, see, I'm telling you, your God just calls for Because I'm going to tell you, I don't know if you know this or not, but folks who don't believe in God, who don't believe in our God, who don't believe in Christianity, who don't believe in God at all, they, they will, it, it, is a, it is a massive leap of, of reason, that, just, just a blind leap into nothingness as far as reason goes, but they will blame all of the wars and the violence over the past 2,000 years over religion and the belief in God. When in fact, the bloodiest philosophy on the planet in the last 200 years, 300 years, maybe historically, I haven't studied it, is communism, which on its face denies God. So it's a massive leap of reason that has no place or no footing in reality. However, they will do that, and they will use things like the Inquisition and, 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 and the Crusades to back that up. Now, some of y'all are going, wow, this is really deep. I'm just too much into this. I'm Can I tell you that the conversation is the same with people that don't bring up history? It's just not about history. It's about you. Because they'll say, <laughs> preacher... Preacher, I know you want me to accept God, but I'm not sure why I should. I know Bubba. He goes to your church. And if God's going to let him in, preacher, I'm good. I don't know if you named Bubba today or not, but see, it's the same conversation. Your God didn't make much of a difference in the life of this person or that person or the other person because I see them every day and I don't see God in them. See, here's the problem. We've become convinced that it's not matter, it does not matter how we clothe ourselves. And I'm here to tell you it does. I'm here to tell you that God has called us not to be people of anger, rage, malice, slander. God's called us not, God, God's not called us to be those people. He's called us to be people of prayer and people of thought and people who are reaching the world around us for him. Three things. Three things. And here's how we're going to do this today. From chapter 3, I'm going to give you a stop. Stop doing this. From chapter 4, I'm going to give you a start. Start doing this. Because what we want to do is we want to replace one habit with another. That's what we're going to do today, okay? We're going to replace one habit. We're going to stop this. You're going to start that. We're going to take a bad habit and replace it with a good habit. Everybody's ready? Wow. All right. All right, you ready? Ready? Here we go. Stop, stop, stop giving in to anger. Stop giving in to anger. Stop giving in to to anger. I did not say stop being angry because everybody gets angry. It's not a question of whether the emotion of anger occurs in your life. It's a question of whether you are going to give in to the emotion of anger and allow that anger to drive you. In fact, the words here, anger and rage, these words in the Greek literally give a, a, an image of an anger that overtakes my life to the point that I have to act out in it, an anger that overtakes my life to the point that it drives my life, and anger literally, in the terms of the word used for rage, literally the idea is an anger that glows like a burning ember inside of my soul. 
That kind of anger, you say, well, I'm not that angry, so I'm good. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. don't go there. Don't go there, don't go there. See, we got to stop giving into anger. You say, but, but, but pastor, how am I supposed, I can't, how am I supposed to do that? Well, let's understand a couple of things, all right? First of all, let's understand why you give in to anger. You give in to anger for the same reason you give in to the sexual issues we talked about two weeks ago. When you give in to anger, it feels good. That's why you give in to it. It's therapeutic for you. It's a drug for you. You've gotten used to it. You need it once in a while to wash over your brain and give you that little high. It just feels good. I told him up. You feel better? Oh, yeah. I punched him out. You feel better? Oh, yeah. <laughs> for, for, folks, listen. We've got to control that emotion of anger. I mean, listen, y'all. Brace yourself. Even on the beltway, I flipped him off with my new life sticker on the back. I hate your guts. God still loves you. Here we go. regularly get pictures in the mail from folks with new life stickers on cars doing stuff. <laughs> you need to know this is a this is a, the media around you, dude. The pastor's going to find out. <laughs> you know, and I don't even want to know. Oh, wow. Mm. Wow, that bumper sticker and our new wow. You know. <laughs> you got to control that that, that rage, you can't just give into it because it feels good. You say, Pastor, I can't control it. I can't control it. What? What do you mean you can't control it? I can't control it. Stop, 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 stop. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, we established the first one, right? You give into it because it feels good. Let, you say, no, Pastor, it's deeper than that. It's deeper than, it's deeper than that. <laughs> well, okay, fine. It's deeper than that. All right, uh, let, let's go there. Uh, uh, let me make sure, let me make sure. Again, we do this so many times. Y'all are going to just be in your sleep quoting these things. But, but, but let's, let, let's go through it. Let's make sure we're clear. You were created by God in his image. Amen? Amen. All right. You were, you were washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. What you talking about you can't? Even if you can't. You were created in the image of God. You are a child of the king. And washed clean by the blood of Jesus and filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Don't give me can't. The Holy Spirit within you can. You say, well, how do I get hold of that? Let's go back where we started. How about prayer? Well, what am I supposed to pray for? Good question. Stop giving into anger. Start praying for wisdom. Start praying for wisdom because wisdom trumps anger. I'm going to say that again. I want you to hear it. Because wisdom trumps anger. Can I say this a little more simply? If you'll turn your brain on, on you'll get your mouth turned off. You got to get your brain turned on. You got to pray that God will give you wisdom. If it's even just a split second, that split second when you go, that moment, that split second, if your brain would come on and go, that's a bad idea. And you would listen to that. You could draw back and bring control into your life. See, I, I think sometimes we're, we're, we're praying, oh, Lord, I messed up. I did this, and here you are. And, oh, geez, I need you to get me out of this because I'm just getting here, and I can't get out of this. And, Lord, I need I think God's in heaven going, hey, dude, hey, hey. Remember that voice back at the beginning of all this says, you shouldn't do that. That was me. I doubt he would be that angry about it, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, when we would listen, if we'll just learn to listen, pray and listen to the voice of God, then we will have wisdom in our lives, and wisdom will trump anger. Can I say it another way? It's smart to control your anger. It's just smart. Because that anger is not going to do anything but destroy you and hurt you. 
And if you're smart, you'll figure out how to control it. So I'm not all that smart. You pray that the Holy Spirit will make you smart, and he will. The Bible says very clearly, does any of you lack wisdom? Let him ask of God who gives generously. You pray for that wisdom. Number two. Number two. Number one, stop giving in to anger. Start praying for wisdom. Number two, stop giving in to malice. Stop giving in to malice. Now, what is malice? Malice and slander here go together because malice and slander is the next step, honestly, of anger and rage. Because anger and rage comes along and you're just mad. Malice and slander is a plan to get even. If anger and rage is the sin of not controlling my anger, then malice is the sin of planning my vengeance. You see, malice is, is ill will toward another person. Best spoken, malice is ill will toward another person that is played out in a plan to bring that person harm. Slander is exactly the same thing, except you're doing it by lies and deceit. You're planting lies. You're planting bad ideas about folks. I got to tell you, I, I, I really get tired in our culture. I, I'm just going I'm to be blunt here. I get really tired in our culture of slander being a good political ploy. It's not good politics. It's not good planning. It's not good business. Well, I'm going to say this about them because people will stop going to their business, start coming to mine. That's not good business. That's not godly. That's not putting on grace. That's not being clothed in grace. That's honestly being clothed in self-centeredness and self-serving attitudes. And our, our society somehow has decided that truth doesn't matter. Winning does. That'll destroy us. That'll destroy us as a culture and it'll destroy you as an individual. Truth matters. And, and the truth is that the Bible says that vengeance belongs to God, not you. You say, but you don't know what they did to me. I, 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 I don't. But I know this. God made it very clear. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And he will take care of that. <coughs> he will deal with that. He will deal with it. Not your job. Well, I got to get even. No, you got to get over. You got to get past it. You got to let it go. You say, well, okay, okay, okay. Then what am I supposed to do now? Pray for grace. Pray for grace. Pray for a grace that forgives. Pray for a grace that releases. You said, but, but, but I want to be angry. I need to be angry. I got to get even. No, you don't need to be angry. You don't need to get even. You need to let it go. Because if you don't let it go, it's just going to eat away at you and it's just going to destroy you. That anger does nothing positive for you. That malice does nothing positive for you. It just destroys you. You say, no, I'm destroying him. <laughs> no. And quite honestly, some of you have been chasing vengeance for so long that if you ever truly let go of it, you'd have to figure out a new way to think and a new way to live. And it's time to do that. It's time to let it go. It's time to walk away from it. So, but I have a right to be hurt. You do have a right to be hurt, but I want you to hear me. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot harbor anger and find healing at the same time. If you want to find healing, you got to let go of the anger. If you want to find healing, you got to let go of the malice. Folks, you know what? Our culture has sold us such a bill of goods on this stuff. Our culture has taught us that anger and rage is a good thing. It's a manly thing. Our culture has taught us that malice and getting even is the way you win a reality TV show. Our culture has taught us that slander is how you get elected to office. Our, cult our culture has taught us all these things. And friends, listen to me. It's killing us. It's killing us. 
you know, maybe it's not a bad idea to limit the size of a Coke in New York City, but can we limit the size of a lie in a political contest at the same time? Because I think that one's killing us faster than the Coca-Cola is. I gotta tell you, we've got to find a way, us as Christians, to actually put on grace. Pastor, I think you're telling me to forgive so-and-so. I am. Because that's where you're gonna find healing. That's where you're gonna find peace. That's where you're gonna be able to, listen, move on and get past it. And that's what we need to do. All right, all right. Stop giving in to anger, start praying for wisdom. Stop giving in to malice, start praying for grace. Now let me put up this last slide here. And let me put it up there without the answers. And I just want to show you these two verses. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Rid yourself of what? <laughs> See, nobody ever wants to answer that. Isn't that interesting? Last night, nobody would read that. You guys, <laughs> let's try it again. Rid yourself of what? There you go. It's a little stronger because now you don't want to be called out, so you have to actually say it. <laughs> Rid yourself of filthy language. Can't hear you, Listen, let me tell you something. Our culture has sold us such a bill of goods on language. I mean, come on. It's, it's just, mm, there's no sense in it. I've watched, I've watched movies before that were supposed to be wonderful movies that were, that were, that were, actually, that were actually recommended to me. And I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm really not a prude on these things. I'm really not. But I just, I just, I just had to turn the movie off. It's like I, 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 I can't listen to the F-bomb that many times. I just, I just can't do it. You know, after a while I'm like, oh, wow. Just... He said, come on, pastor, it's just, it's, just, it's just culture. It's the way we talk. Well, culture's wrong. Yeah. They're wrong. You say, well, how do you know they're wrong? Well, because God said they are. <laughs> the Bible says don't, don't, don't be enmeshed, immersed in filthy language. Okay, pastor. All right, I'm ready. I'm ready. I got my pen. I got my pen. I'm ready. What words can I say? <laughs> Yeah, right. Like you're going to drag me down that road. <laughs> no. I'm not here to come against certain phrases. Okay, I'll come against one. Um, Y'all, listen, can I just say something? I just, this, 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 this one bothers me. There's a lot of them that bother me, but this one really bothers me. It, 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 men, men, look at me. Men, men, boys, listen, because you'll need to know this later. If you are a boy, you need to know this later. And I mean that. I don't care what your age is. And if you're doing what I'm about to say, you're a boy, not a man. <laughs> Never refer to the woman you have devoted your life to as a female dog. Right. Stop it. Just stop it. I mean, come on. Can I, get a, can, can, I, can I appeal to your selfish side? You married a dog? <laughs> Ladies, if he refers to you as a dog, don't come whining to me when he treats you like one. What do you expect? Said, Pastor, that wasn't nice. I know. And if you come and cry, we will sit and we will comfort you and console you because you will see Pastor Aaron, not me. <laughs> but I'm trying to get your attention. If he's going to call you names when he's dating you, he's, he's, what, what do you expect when he marries you? Listen, if he abuses the cow before he bought it, what do you reckon he's going to do to it when it's in his own pasture? That was ugly, wasn't it? Do <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? That's just one. That's just one word. Oh, how many words could we chase? My mama used to, I, I used to ask my mom from time to time, I would say, is that a bad word? 
You know what she would say to me? It was very interesting. She would say, well, it's not a good one. <laughs> okay. I get that. You know, and, and, and look, 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 look. She said, well, what, what, what words? Look, look. Don't be profane in the way you do things. But I got to tell somebody off. Look, look listen, y'all, I got to tell you something. Profanity is an absolute indicator of a lack of vocabulary. If you can't insult somebody in such a way that they thank you for your kind words on their way out, don't even try. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It goes back to the wisdom part. Think. Think before you let something fly out of your mouth. Think before you act in a certain way. Stop peppering with profanity and start seasoning with salt. You say, well, what words should I use? Words that flavor. Words that preserve. Words that add value. Words that speak of grace and kindness. Generosity and goodness. Words that are truth, words that are pure, words that are loving, and words that are full of grace. Those are the words we need to use. You say, Pastor, I'm not even going to know how to talk for a week or two. <laughs> It'll do you good. It'll do you good. All right. Now, let me just talk to you for a minute. I'm concerned about the ability of the church to reach the culture we're in. I'm very concerned about that. And I'm concerned about it for this reason. I'm not concerned about how much our culture likes our Jesus. They like Jesus. They, they, they like him. They think the world of him. They think he's a great teacher. They think he's probably, if not God, a whole lot like God. They don't like us. And they don't like us because they've not seen people clothed in truth. And they've not seen people clothed in purity. And they've not seen people clothed in love. And they've not seen people clothed in grace. Honestly, when the world looks at the church these days, they don't see a forgiving, graceful people. They see an angry people. They don't see a truthful people. They see a people who will accept any lie that comes down the pipe. They don't see a pure people. They see a bunch of wife-swapping folks who gather together once a week in a place with a cross on it. They don't, see, they don't see loving people. They see people that will tell them off if you take their pew. Folks, we're never going to reach the society we are in until we are actually clothed in truth, in purity, in love, and in grace. But I'll tell you this much. If we ever become who Christ has called us to be, if we ever actually become a people clothed in truth, a people clothed in purity, a people clothed in love, a people clothed in grace, I promise you this, there'll never be a building big enough to put them all in. Because when they find a God and a people who follow that God that look like that, they'll tear the doors down trying to get to him. You say, well, why aren't they tearing the doors down in a lot of churches? Yeah, I'm going to let you process that, process that on your own. Let me pray for you. Father, forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us for showing the world an image of you that is not real. Forgive us for empowering the attitudes of people who would deny you. Forgive us for empowering the thought in people's minds 
that you are not real or a relationship with you is not meaningful or helpful. Forgive us for living in anything other than truth and teach us to be clothed in truth. Forgive us for living in anything other than purity and teach us to be clothed in purity. Forgive us, Heavenly Father, for being clothed in anything other than love and teach us to be clothed in love. And forgive us, Father, for allowing our lives and our attitudes and our reactions to people around us to be clothed in anything but grace. And teach us to be a people full of grace. Father, as the world looks around and sees us, and through us sees an image of you, let it be true of us that they see a true image of you in us. Let them look into our lives and actually see the God that they want, desire, need to have a relationship. In this area of reaching people for Christ or pushing them away from you, let us have clean hands. Let us not be guilty of pushing people away from you. Give us clean hands. Give us a pure heart. Help us to stop lifting up our souls to some other God that we have served out of our own feelings or emotions or anger. And let us instead lift up the name of the God of all eternity. And let us lift up that name in truth, in purity, in love, and in grace. Make it true, Lord. We give you praise.